very good. And let me record. Okay. Good evening. That was Sam Cook singing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. And our co-host will give us a little bit more about that tribute in a little bit. Welcome to From Arrest to Arraignment. This program is brought to you by the friends of the James Brown African American Room and the Newark Public Library. This is being recorded and live streamed on the library's Facebook page. Please visit the library's YouTube channel for other programs you may have missed, such as our COVID-19 series. My name is Dale Colston, and I'm the principal librarian at the Newark Public Library in the James Brown African American Room. Tonight, I'm joined by my co-host, Carter. My Hi. colleagues, fellow librarians, Reggie Blanding and New Jersey Information Center librarian, Beth Zach Cohen, are providing technical support and we thank them both. Our space at the library was named in honor of the late James Library Brown, a librarian, poet, activist, and influencer who was instrumental in making sure that the library seek and maintain books and resources and present programs examining and celebrating the African-American experience. We would like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Lenny Lenape First Nations on which we are learning, laboring, and organizing today. We also recognize the devastation and the continued legacy of the transatlantic slave trade, which has contributed to present day systemic racism and oppression. We want to acknowledge the lives of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Elijah McClain, Sandra Bland, and countless others. We are working to honor their legacy, Black Lives Matter. May I kindly remind you, if you have not already done so, to please fill out your census form today it's 10 simple questions. We need to be counted. Remember too, to register and vote this November. And my colleague will put a link to the census and a link to voter registration in our chat room. And we'll also provide that on our Facebook page uh, as soon as possible. Okay, Beth, can you begin with the, the photo of Reverend Vivian, please? Cordy Tyndale Vivian was a leading member of the Freedom Riders a group of activists who took interstate bus rides to the South to protest segregated bus terminals and often suffered beatings and arrests as a result. Here, Reverend C.T. Vivian is pictured after a 1961 arrest. Beginning in 1963, Reverend Vivian served as the National Director of Affiliates for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. In that role, he became an ally of Martin Luther King Jr. A major, and a major organizer of civil rights actions across the South. He died last Friday at the age of 95. Wow. And we have another photo, Beth, please. Thank you. John Robert Lewis was often called one of the most courageous persons in the civil rights movement that it was ever produced. He dedicated his life to protecting human rights, securing civil liberties, and building what he called the beloved community in America. Despite more than 40 arrests, physical attacks, and serious injuries, Congressman Lewis remained a devoted advocate of the philosophy of nonviolence. He was the last surviving member of the Big Six, which included Dr. King, James Farmer, A. Philip Randolph, Roy Wilkins, and Whitney Young. He passed away last Friday too, and he was 80. The co-host for the evening, Linda McDonald Carter, is an attorney and professor of paralegal studies at Essex County College in Newark. She is also a founding member of the Friends of the James Brown African American Room. Please join me in welcoming Linda McDonald Carter. Hi everyone, how are you? Isn't this great? No parking. Uh, we don't have to have any face mask on and we don't have to be six to 20 feet from each other. So this is a great day. Anyway, I want to um, just, you know, I'm just happy you're all here and uh, we're waiting, but Connie McGee should be joining us. But in the meanwhile, let me go ahead and give you a little background of our guests. Um, but before I do that, just a quick note. This program really came out of initially 
the Central Park Five last year, and we decided to do it again in light of the protests that are happening today so that people would have information available to them in the event they got caught up in the system. And uh, Del will re repeat what I said later on today to let you know that the information, the steps in the process from arrest to arraignment will be posted on the Facebook page and the James Brown African American Facebook page. It'll be available and also there will be a floor plan for a police station. So if you don't know what a police station looks like and if you have to go in, you'll already know what to expect. Having said that, we'll proceed with the program. So first of all, there's Daryl Pennington. Daryl is a graduate of Rutgers Law School and formerly a public defender. He's currently a defense attorney for Pennington and Associates. Uh, our other presenter is Connie Bentley McGee. She's a graduate of Temple University School of Law and, Se and Seton Hall School of Law with an advanced degree in trial advocacy. She's been recognized as one of New Jersey's super lawyers in the field of criminal law. She also wow. serves as a prosecutor. Uh, our third presenter is Manuel Gomez. Manuel is a Desert Storm in Afghanistan veteran and a former New York City police officer. He is the CEO of Black Ops, a private investigation, a firm whose mission is to free the innocent. And on that note, I guess we can start with Mr. Pennington. Mr. Pennington? Daryl? Daryl, he's here. Good evening. I didn't expect to go first, so you really caught me off guard. Um, You're good on your feet. Yeah, then we'll have to see what we have. Um, I am a criminal defense attorney, and that's all I do is, is criminal defense. Um, before we get started, there's a couple of things that I do want to uh, bring out to everybody. There is a book that I encourage everybody to read. It's a very small book. It's called You Have the Right to Remain Innocent. It's on Am Amazon for $4.99. I encourage everybody to read. In fact, I tell all of my clients before I represent you, you must agree to read this book. Um, every single word in that book is vital to uh, what you should do if you are encountered by the police. Um, I suggest, and I give, I've given it to all of my loved ones, all, and I've told everybody, um, especially if you have young kids, you should read the book. The book is essentially what people who are part of the criminal justice system, judges, prosecutors, police, lawyers, what they tell their children if their children are ever stopped. It essentially says, don't say anything. Um, I encourage all of you to please read the book and um, it will give you some significant insight on how to react to this. Um, I am going to talk about initially what you should do or what you should not do um, if you are stopped by the police. And I want to start with the fact that uh, I'm assuming that we're all drivers here. If you are driving and you are pulled over, the first thing I want everybody to do is keep in mind, remain calm. I tell you, leave your seatbelt on, roll down all the windows in your car, even if it's zero degrees, roll all your windows down, turn on all your interior lights. If you have any passengers in your car, tell every passenger to shut up or get out. When the police come, keep your hands on the steering wheel um, and be compliant. Do exactly what they ask you to do. And if you're going to do something, some movement, tell them what you're going to do. If they ask you for your license, your registration, explain to them that I keep it in my glove box. I'm going to reach over to my glove compartment or it's in my visor. I'm going to reach and get, um, get my visor or it's in my pocket, my handbag. As long as they know what you're doing and you have let them know in advance what they should expect. Um, it should help everybody else out. Keep in mind that when the police pull you over, particularly when you're in a car and it's at night, they're nervous. They don't know what they're coming up on. They are absolutely nervous and, and certainly they should be. Probably as nervous as you because you don't know what you're gonna face. So it's important that everybody involved remains calm and you, and you don't do anything that's gonna upset the other person. The next thing you do is you remain compliant. Do what he says. Don't give him a hard time, him or her. And part of the reason is because once you get your ticket, if you go to court, the first thing the prosecutor is going to ask the officer is, did this person give you a hard time? If the officer says yes, 
now you've got a tougher job of, of getting some some justice to add there. Um, so I always want the officer to say, nope, they did everything I asked them to do. Nice person makes our job easier when you when you when you go to court. Um, expect that you're probably going to get a ticket, um, accept the ticket and, and let it go. Live to fight another day. That's the best advice I can get. That's what I give to everybody I can think of. Um, if you happen to be encountering a police officer while you're on the street, um, what I say to everybody is deal with that situation as if you have somehow unexpectedly encountered a vicious dog. And by that, I mean you want to, again, remain calm. You don't want to make any quick movements with your hands or any part of your body. Um, you don't want to talk loudly. You don't want to make any unnecessary movements. And I also say don't make eye contact. Don't give the officer or the dog, for that matter, um, any reason to feel threatened. Uh, keep your hands in plain sight at all times. And again, remain compliant. Do what's exactly as asked of you. Um, explain what you need to do if they, if they order you to do something. Um, but at the end of the day, recognize that you have very special rights. And those rights are something that you should adhere to upon an arrest. Um, I say this, and I'm going, to, I'm going to qualify once I say it. I believe every time a police officer interacts with a citizen, that police officer has violated that citizen's constitutional rights. And I want to make sure that you understand, I'm not saying that every cop gets up and decides they're going to go out there and they're going to find somebody and handcuff them to something and beat them and all of that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. When you get stopped by the police, you have to do one thing, identify yourself. Beyond that, you have nothing else that you are required to do in dealing with the police. So if the police ask you where you're going, you don't have to answer. Where you're coming from, where you've been, how come you're in this neighborhood, you don't have to answer any of those questions. Um, and I recommend that you don't. I always argue when that takes place, that's a violation of the person's Fifth Amendment rights in that you are being asked to give testimony against yourself during a police investigation. So you don't have to say anything. But when you do this, accept that probably you're going to get taken in. You're going to spend some time in the police station or something like that, um, which I say is much better than spending time. If you're ever going to get arrested, there's only four words you should ever say. If you say five words, you've gone too far. I want my lawyer. That's it. The fifth word will get you in trouble. Uh, if you read this book that I've mentioned to you, you will find out how much trouble you can get in with that fifth word, whatever it is going to be. Um, and beyond that, you really don't have to say anything else. If you're going to be arrested, they will give you your rights. You have the right to remain silent, blah, 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 blah. We've all heard all the rights that are on TV. At the end of that, they're going to ask you, do you wish to exercise these rights? Your answer is yes, and nothing else. If they insist you say something else, the something else is, I want my lawyer. That's the entire discussion. Once you've been arrested, you're probably going to get processed. They'll take your fingerprints. They'll take a picture of you. They will ask you some biological questions that I suggest you don't answer. They will have your identification. Let them take it from that. And, and if they don't have anything other than that, any other way to get it, they'll just have to wait till your attorney gets there and they can ask him or her. Um, I want to, I keep saying this, I want to stress how important it is that you do not say anything to these police. Police officers are trained to, they are expected to, they are told to, they are encouraged to, and they can legally lie to you in trying to get information from you. Um, there's a story in the book you're going to read where the police arrested a guy and they told him that his daughter, who was about three years old, was dead. She died, and if you tell us what we need to know, we'll get you to your daughter. He told them what they needed to know. They arrested him. The daughter was fine, but they used this confession against him, so they lied to him. Um, there have been cases that I've gone to the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court of the United States has says the police can tell you lies in order to get information from you. They are trying to be deceptive. They are trying to get information from you. They may be very nice to you, but they're not on your side. Their job is to make an arrest. And, and I emphasize that by saying, if you ever look at a, a police complaint, it has all this information. On the bottom of the document, it says, this case is closed by arrest. That means as far as the police are concerned, they've done their job. They've arrested you. And th the case is closed. The police get, get 
you know, they get to check off a box for making an arrest, not for being nice to you. Um, the, the rights you get say to you, anything you say can and will be used against you. And that's what happens. Whatever you say can and will be used against you. And if you say something that is helpful to you, it won't be used for you. The, the, the rights do not say you, anything you say can be used to help you. It will be used against you. Every word in that statement that they make when they give you rights is important. Um, so once you've been fingerprinted, once you have your mugshot taken in, um, at some point, you'll probably go before a judge. You may do it by a video. You may go in the court face to face. On the, on, at that point, there's going to be an arraignment where the judge and everybody has to tell you. Well, let me tell you this, too. Generally, you should have an attorney at the arraignment, uh, but sometimes you don't. If you don't have an attorney at the arraignment, be prepared to say two words and nothing else. Not guilty. Whatever the judge says to you, even if you think you are 100% completely guilty and they caught you red handed, your answer is not guilty. So the judge is going to read off the charges where you've been charged with, I don't know, shoplifting, you went to Walmart, you stole $400 worth of stuff. How do you plead? Not guilty. If you're having a lawyer there, the lawyer will say it for you. If there's no lawyer, it's not guilty. You can work it out later on. Um, that's generally the arraignment process. At that point, the court will determine whether or not they're going to release you. In the old days, it was a, they, would, they would set a bail. Um, now that there's no monetary bail or, or almost none, um, it's determined whether or not you will be released. The criteria is based on a couple of very few things. Whether or not you have ever been to court before have ever been ordered to court and didn't show up. Um, whether what your history looks like, if you got a long history of being, you know, derelict in your duties as a, as a citizen, they're going to hold that against you. They're going to hold against you whether or not you would be a flight risk. If you've ever fled before, that would, that would not help you. Um, if you would be somehow harmful or somehow a danger to the community, will determine whether or not they will release you. And if you're ever going to take any steps that would impede the progress of prosecuting your case or somehow circumvent the law, those things will be taken into consideration whether or not you will be released without a bail. Um, generally, the, the, a form that's filled out and the form has two rows on the top row, there's numbers one through six on the bottom row, it's number one through six. The closer you get to a one over one, the better off you are. The closer you get to a six over six, the worse off you are. But by and large, people get released from, from jail at an initial arrest. Um, and at that point, if you have not yet gotten an attorney, your first phone call should be to, um, I would suggest if you're, if you're a minor, call a parent. If you're a young adult, call a parent. If you're older, call a spouse or let somebody know what's going on and then call an attorney. And from that point on, things will sort of flow, whether or not you will be able to move forward with, with how your case is going to move forward. Um, I want to make another point. I know that I've been talking a lot, but there's something that's been on my mind um, most recently. I have heard people say over the years that by and large, the police are good people. And there's one or two bad cops that make it look bad for the rest of them. Um, and I used to want to believe that. I no longer believe that. Even if there's a person, a cop who's a decent person, there is a culture in the police that allows for mistreatment to take place. Um, if the, the cops are charged with, the cops are paid for, the cops are trained to protect and serve. So anytime a police officer is aware of a person who is somehow being mistreated, his or her responsibility is to protect and serve. And anytime he or she doesn't do that, that person has done something illegal. That person has violated the oath they had taken. That makes that a person a bad cop. If you stand around and you watch the guy behind you put a knee on a guy's neck and you don't do anything about it, you're a bad cop because you have to do something to protect the people. Um, and you also always hear you know, people say, oh, you got to help. We come to talk to you. You don't give us any information. You don't snitch. That's a bad thing, this whole not snitching thing. You ever heard of the blue wall of silence? Don't say anything against another officer. If you do, tell a lie. How is that different than not snitching? 
it's the same exact thing. So it's unfortunate that I have come to believe this thing, but because there's a culture that allows for this sort of identity to fester and allows cops to uh, get away with doing some things that they want to do, I firmly believe that by and large, anybody who takes part in that system and allows it to progress is not doing his or her duty and is a bad cop. Now, I do understand that that every cop doesn't get up and intend to shoot somebody every day. But when you know that somebody did something illegal, a cop did something and didn't do anything about it, that's a problem. Now, we have a circumstance now where the police are being seen on videos doing all kinds of egregious things. And the thing that keeps going through my mind is, what do we do when they don't, when they're not on video? These people, some of them know they're being filmed and they're doing this stuff anyway which means it's routine. It's part of the, the regular regular way of doing business. And that's very unfortunate. There's one more thing that I want to say, and I think most of us have probably seen this on, on TV. There's the old man, he's 76 years old. He's in, I think, Buffalo. He walks up to a phalanx of police officers. I don't know what's going to happen, but they push him down. He's 76 years old. He hits his head. He's laying on the sidewalk. He is clearly in distress. Some people said his head was bleeding. Some I don't know, but he was clearly in distress. Another officer walks over to help the guy up, going to run to some aid to him. The cop walks up and pulls him away, will not let him help this old man. And then they walk away and several dozen other police officers walk past this man who was laying on the sidewalk. For me, that goes beyond being a bad cop. That's a bad human being. That's a bad person. You can't do that. You can't see a person laying on the sidewalk absolutely in need of some sort of help. And you walk by him like he's not there. Or you prevent somebody else from helping him. I don't understand how a person could do that. But what it does do, it allows me to understand how a person can put a knee on a guy's neck and choke him until he's dead. How a person can shoot a guy in the back who's running away from you and you already know where he's going, he's going home. How you can go into somebody's home and shoot somebody while they're in bed or sleep. <clears throat> yeah, I understand that mindset now. And it's, it's not a rational thing to do. And it's probably something that's inhumane. And the, anybody who can walk past this man laying on the sidewalk is the same kind of person who will either be, be, be prepared to shoot some guy in the back who's running away from a traffic stop or turn his back on it and not mention it or tell a lie about it when asked to do the right thing. Uh, so I suggest that, that whenever we're dealing with the police, um, let's think in our minds that we are dealing with somebody who does not have your best interest at heart and you need to do the right things to make sure that you are not mistreated. The best thing you can do is remain calm don't give them a hard time and don't say anything. Thank you, Mr. Pennington. And now we're going to hear from Prosecutor Connie McGee. <laughs> Hi, everybody. And uh, glad to be on this call from a cell phone. I hope you can see me okay. <laughs> a little difficult logging on. Um, actually, even as a prosecutor, I agree with Daryl's comments. Um, it, it's in this culture that we live in and certainly in the context of George Floyd and his dying, being killed at the hands of a police officer, we're all involved in what happens. And whether we're out there protesting or fighting in the courtroom as a prosecutor or a defense attorney, we're still all involved. Uh, my, um, history, so to speak, goes back to Rodney King. And I had an opportunity to train at a trial lawyer's college in Dubois, Wyoming. And Milton oh. King was, Milton, Milton King, mixing up Milton Grimes and Rodney King. Milton Grimes was an attorney on staff at the trial lawyer college. And he shared with us his experiences with Rodney King and how he represented Rodney on the civil side. Now, when you represent somebody on the civil side, you're also a prosecutor in a sense because you're advocating for the rights of someone and what you believe has been done to them or how they've been harmed. So in that sense, Milton Grimes was a prosecutor 
And he actually came to New Jersey um, shortly after that to talk to the Garden State Bar Association. So I began to see a relationship between prosecutors on the criminal side and civil attorneys who are representing plaintiffs. Prosecutor, one thing I, I heard uh, Daryl say is that uh, one of the best things we can do is to be calm or the best thing you can remind your client to do <clears throat> is be calm. And certainly as a prosecutor, in the face of passion and commitment from defense counsel, sometimes I just really want to, you know, sit back and say, look, enough already. I don't want to hear this anymore. And that's not going to help the situation. So however I can get to that spot where I can be with the Daryl Penningtons of the world, where I can be a prosecutor and at the same time follow the rules that we have, because that's what I've taken an oath to do is to follow our rules. So some people may say the prosecutor is the persecutor. Or when I was a public defender, I was called the public offender, okay? Uh, investigator might be the instigator. You hear that, Manuel? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying that we all hear these names, but actually as a prosecutor, my job and my mission is to see that justice is done and to seek justice. So that might be hard to do sometimes. I cannot do it alone. It's done with a team. This program is geared towards what happens from arrest to arraignment. And I'm more conscious than ever how important the investigative part of this is because often in the context of George Floyd again, some people never get to be arrested. And I say get to be, not like it's a place you want to be or get to go to, but because they never even have the opportunity to stand up and say at arraignment, not guilty. And that's just horrific for me to think about knowing what we're going through with everything else in the context also of this pandemic. But pre-arrest, just like you have a crime and you can be arrested for that crime or indicted, meaning formally charged, indicted for attempted crime. I'm starting to think that these attempted arrests that are made where some people never get to be arrested is really diminishing our society and us as humanity and what we're all about. As a prosecutor and with investigation, I want to find out what happened up to the point of arrest. What happened that caused this person to be arrested? Because as the prosecutor, okay. once you're arrested, I have to make a decision about whether your offense rises to the level of a crime or should it be maintained in municipal court? Municipal court handles all of the disorderly persons offenses and city ordinances. City ordinance violations are not crimes. Uh, often in municipal court, and I work in several as a municipal prosecutor, I'll find that someone may have been arrested or charged with a summons for a disorderly person's offense. Disorderly person's offense means that prior to, um, well, if you plead guilty, you're subject to a fine of up to $1,000 or six months in jail. That has not happened in any of the courts that I work in. Ordinarily, it's a fine and that's the end of it. If the case is downgraded, which I can do, I downgrade to a city ordinance depending upon the circumstances of the offense. And then once it's downgraded, that information is forwarded to the judge. And on the record, the judge will say whether he agrees or disagrees with that recommendation. Now that municipal court complaint, that criminal complaint, let's say it's a CDS violation, a controlled dangerous substance violation. Well, a superior court prosecutor also looked at that information. 
because they review everything that comes to the municipal court and they make a determination. Is this something that should be sent to superior court or should it be maintained in municipal court? And when that happens, if it goes to superior, it's out of my hands, usually. Sometimes it might go to superior court and then the superior court decides to send it back down. Now this is all after mm -hmm. arrest and before a person is formally charged. Indictment means that your offense, your crime has been submitted to a grand jury and this is a jury normally of about 24 or 25 people and they meet periodically and they review all of the complaints that come into the superior court. The grand jury proceedings are very important because you have a jury of your peers who make a decision on whether or not it's more likely than not that you committed a crime. Now, you'll hear people say you can indict a ham sandwich. Well, the threshold is so low for indictment, you probably could, because it's just, is it more likely than not? And what does more likely than not mean? It means it's more likely than not that you were the person that committed the crime. Does it mean you committed the crime? No, it doesn't. But just based upon the information that's presented at grand jury, it's possible that you could be the person that committed the crime. Now, I don't know what goes on in the grand jury. I've never presented as a prosecutor to the grand jury, but I did represent a client as a defense attorney who had to go before the grand jury. And he was really given permission to go because prosecutors rarely call in a defendant to the grand jury. This was a multi-defendant case. My client was allowed to go in and speak. We certainly conferenced many times about what to say. And he went in and at the end of the case, he was no billed. And no bill means no indictment against him. So first time it's ever happened and also the first time I ever conferenced and consulted with someone before they did go into the grand jury. With the grand jury, which ordinarily happens um, after arrest and your initial arraignment, an initial arraignment for minor offenses that's held in municipal court. If it's a major offense like murder, robbery, aggravated assault of some kind, that would be held in superior court. But at the arraignment, the charges against you are read. And like Mr. Pennington said, I suggest you simply give your name, your address, correct any uh, contact information that the court may have and say you're not guilty. As a prosecutor, I don't care how you feel at the arraignment, arraignment okay? Um, it's not about feelings, it's about what do the facts say. So I'm simply interested in who you are and what your plea is. If you're represented by counsel, that's great. I can talk to counsel. I know counsel is fully aware of the court rules and we can communicate on that level. If you're representing yourself, it may be a little bit harder because I find myself explaining some of the terms that we use or how we do things. And I, I try to do it in a way that makes it comfortable for you as a pro se defendant. And I've also found that judges tend to favor pro se defendants in terms of how they're treated in the courtroom. They don't know the rules, um, meaning they have not become licensed to practice law, although they may know a whole lot more than a lot of lawyers out here, but technically they're not uh, charged with the same responsibility as uh, lawyers are with respect to representing themselves. So arrested, okay? 
arraigned the first time, either municipal court or superior court. And then what happens? Well, the information is taken to the grand jury. The prosecutor is still involved because the prosecutor now has to make a decision as to whether this case is not as serious as let's say a murder or first degree robbery, you went out and robbed the bank of $80,000. If it's not a more serious felony offense and felony means that you could go to jail for a year or longer, if it's not a felony, then maybe your matter can be treated as an accusation, meaning you're accused of something, but it really hasn't risen to the level of a grand jury indictment. Normally accusations are to a lesser offense and you're given an opportunity to plead to lesser penalties. Uh, you may go to court and your accusation, let's say you decide you don't want to accept it. Well, that's up to you. You can still say not guilty, I don't want it. Your matter will go to a grand jury and you may be indicted. Now you've already been arraigned once. After <laughs> indictment, you're arraigned again, okay? And this is after indictment and the charges which may be the same or may have been upgraded to some extent, you are indicted again. And at that point, after that arraignment, your trial actually begins. Um, I just want to refer you, if you want some good beach reading, okay? Uh, the rules that cover court would be rule three colon 13, the New Jersey court rules. So if you ever just wanna read something, uh, you can <laughs> simply go there. And okay. uh, rule seven colon seven dash seven covers municipal. Thank so thank you, enjoy being on. Thank you. Thank you now we're gonna have Emmanuel Gomez, who's, a, as I said, is a private investigator, a former police officer in New York City and a veteran. So, Mr. Gomez. I wanna say, first of all, thank you everyone for taking your time out of your day to uh, be here. And thank you, uh, Dr. Carter, for having me on and uh, Attorney Pennington and Prosecutor Connie. Um, I wanna thank you. Um, as again, like she said, um, my job, as a private investigator for the past eight and a half years has been to, and what separates me from other private investigators is I only take cases of innocent people. So the first thing I ask someone is, are you innocent? And if the person says to me, no, then I walk away. Uh, if the, I ask the mother, are you 90% sure? Is your son innocent? They can't tell me they're at least 90% sure I don't take the case, okay? Um, and in this, the reason why I do this I've been doing this now for eight and a half years. I've had 120 cases and I've won all of them. I've not lost one case. And I'm gonna tell you something that I wanna tell everyone out here. Mr. Dale Pennington was correct when he said about be nice when the cops come and so forth. And I agree 100% what Connie said as well, all right? But I wanna add to that. What I tell my people and all the people that I work with and all the people I meet, I tell them, when a cop comes up to you, the first thing you do is say, good evening, officer, what is the probable cause? So when we deal with a prosecutor, the reason why I'm having you do that is I want everyone to look at this. You see this watch? I tell it to my clients and I tell my clients to use this. The phone or the watch, it's a spy watch and it records. It costs a hundred bucks. And if you don't use this, you can use this. Each phone has an app where you can record without the cop knowing, okay? And what you do is you say to the officer, good evening, what is the probable cause for this stop? A lot of times in my cases, the officers, and please excuse the epithet, will tell the person, what the F, give me your license and insurance, and I'll tell you when I want to tell you. Now, when they do that, now you're already establishing that this stop was possibly done incorrectly, inappropriately, okay? And I've won every one of my cases with this. Every one of my cases with this. 
And the reason why is because I, my motto is to all the prosecutors, when you see me, you lost. Because when I walk in, I walk in with the video, the affidavits, and the evidence. And I tell everyone, record, record, record. Protect yourself. Kill them with kindness. Be nice. And then like that, when that prosecutor sees that you've got a video, they're going to think twice at the arraignment and might even dismiss the case if you can show that that cut stop was stopped um, for racial profile or there was no probable cause. A lot of times as a police officer in New York and from the cops that I know in New Jersey, they stop people and we call it night fishing. So what it is is that we'll see three or four black guys sitting in a BMW driving by, listening to music with dark windows to stop that car. Even though the car is driving 20 miles per hour, that car will get stopped. This is why this very document you see up now, which I hope you see it, it's called the Department of Civilian Justice. This is a proposal that I wrote because of the eight years and 120 cases that I've solved, okay, has showed me the corruption is not just within the police department, but the larger corruption is within the prosecutor's offices nationwide, okay? Mr. Dale said, Pennington said, that the, that the police department has this um, mindset of it's us against you, and they're correct. And, and you got to get along, you got to, to get along, you have to go along. So that means if you see something happen, you got to look the other way or your career is over. In this document, what I've produced was an infrastructure for a new agency, which will provide oversight over all the prosecutors, over all the police departments, over all the Department of Corrections. It will have the ability to fire that ADA. It will have the ability to fire the district attorney. It will have the ability to fire the police commissioner and the person that mops the floors in that police department. It will give transparency whether there is any. Right now, in every one of my cases, I've had prosecutorial misconduct, okay? The prosecutors either hold back the evidence, lie in court, get people to lie, make deals with the devil to try to prosecute someone. In my experience as a private investigator, I can honestly tell you that at least 20% of our penal system are innocent people, okay? At least 20%. I keep winning these cases over and over and finding corrupt prosecutors. But there are some good ones out there, not many, but there are some good ones. And the reason why there are some good ones is because I've met them and they've helped me with giving me information and so forth. And I'll get an envelope or a flash drive sometimes sent to me anonymously that will help me crack open a case or a DD5 detective form that was held by the prosecutors so the defense attorney wouldn't win the case. I mean, I just got called two days ago by a person in Patterson, New Jersey, which I have to, uh, you know, hold his name confidential. But the cops, a young black male's house was raided and they falsified the warrant and signed the judge's signature. The cops did this. It was brought to the attention of the prosecutor in court. You know what they did? They went off the record. They shut everything down, and then they finally dismissed the case on the guy. But nothing happened to the cops that did this. It's like the movie, Now You See Us. You see those five black kids who were lives were destroyed for 20 years, and what happened? At the end of the movie, it shows that the prosecutor with the detective falsified the case. What happened? They paid him $40 million. New Jersey pays hundreds of millions of dollars a year in malicious prosecution cases done by prosecutors. All right, there's not a defense attorney can tell me that I'm wrong in what I'm saying. I would even challenge Mr. Pennington to say he hasn't seen a prosecutor lie on those and nothing happened. This is why I wrote this legislation, not only myself, but with a gentleman named Frank Serpico from the movie Serpico, co-wrote it with me. And I'm proud to say, from the last time I spoke with you guys, that now officially this bill is a state bill now in New York. It is now about to become state law for the first time in the United States, this new agency in Connecticut. For the first time, 
the Department of Civil Justice will exist. Now I just found out that North Carolina has now adopted it. Missouri is looking into it and now Georgia. Now I've just uh, drafted a federal version, which now I'm dealing with Congressman Gregory Meeks from Queens to now sponsor it and Congressman Jerry Nala, who is the chair of the judiciary, so we can have oversight over the federal prosecutors and the FBI. Because the bottom line is, these people have immunity. Now, Prosecutor Connie can tell me she has immunity. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why Dale's laughing. <laughs> get away with stuff and you want to know something, but that's not going to happen anymore because I'm here. And that's what this bill is going to do. It's going to bring oversight. It's going to bring transparency. It's going to stop the untouchables, the prosecutors and the judges. And I want to tell everyone, does everyone know how to correct the prosecutor that's corrupt? How to report it to the uh, ethics committee? or to the grievance committee in the second appellate court, or how to report a federal judge or a state judge for violations. Nobody releases that. Attorneys like Mr. Bennington might do it very rarely, but most attorneys won't do that because it violates their code, okay? Everybody's People, this is why I'm educating everyone on how to report corruption. No one is above the law. You know, the greatest thing on our country one of the greatest things is the First Amendment. And one of the parts of the First Amendment that people don't remember or don't use that often is the part of to petition the government to correct grievances and to write new laws. You can write a bill. You don't have to be an attorney. I'm not an attorney. And to the public library, I said, how do you write a bill? And I sat down and read how to do it. What you're holding here, this document is actually the bill proposal the infrastructure, because as a United States Army officer, I learned not to complain about the problem, but to give a solution and to come up with it. This is why Frank Serpico in the movie said, we need an oversight. We need oversight of the police department. But the one thing Frank did that he didn't do, he asked them to create something from nothing. In the Army, we don't do that. We come up with a template. We create a foundation for something and we come up with a solution. This is what the Department of Civilian Justice represents. And anyone out there, my number is 347-867-6242. You got a problem with a prosecutor, call me. I'll show you how to put them in check. You got a problem with an attorney, call me, a judge, a cop. I will show you because this is what I do. I defend the innocent. I give the voice a voice. Okay, now I'm not against lawyers. I'm not against prosecutors, okay? I'm not against cops because I used to be a cop. But I ended my career as a police officer the first 15 minutes on the job. Because the first 15 minutes on the job, when I graduated the academy, I was like Captain America. I felt on top of the world. And what happened? I got into a police car, filled, and actually a police car, it was a police van filled with nine cops. This was my first 15 minutes, graduated from the academy, my first police precinct, the 43rd. And they took me to a pizzeria and they said, jump out the car and throw those four black kids and two Spanish kids against the wall. And they were holding pizzas and soda. And I asked the sergeant, excuse me, sir, but I just graduated yesterday. What is our probable cause for stopping them? They're just holding a pizza. He said, I gave you an effing order, follow it. You know what I told them? I said, Sergeant, you just gave me an illegal order to violate people's civil rights, to throw them against the wall and search them for no reason. Now the eight cops that were in that van with me backed me up, but all of us were separated that day and all of us, our careers ended that day because our career ended the first 15 minutes because we refused to violate people. This is why this document's here. I have too many prosecutors get away with crimes. Too many defense attorneys like Dale here see it, and too many of them haven't done anything to write this. The biggest problem I got right now is Jersey. Your state was found guilty for profiling by the federal government. Connie can tell me I'm right. 
Okay, all your state police were found guilty for racial profiling. What has been done to change it? Do you know that I went to your black assembly members, just to say a couple of names, Assemblywoman McKnight. You know what I was told that this bill was? Difficult because it's gonna ruffle the feathers of the powers to be, okay? So I went to a black assemblywoman that black lives didn't matter. I went to black senators and they said the same thing. So then I said, you know what? The hell with them. I went to the NAACP and guess what? Now I got the national NAACP backing me. And now if Jersey doesn't want it, I'm gonna force it down Jersey's throat by making it a federal law, okay? Because this is what we need. We need oversight. Everybody says no justice, no peace. Nothing's being done here. This is a permanent solution to transparency, and to give something which people have not had, and that is to give the voiceless a voice, okay? Most of my clients are poor black mothers, poor Spanish mothers who live in very bad areas and who can't afford me. I've been paid with a Virginia hem. I got paid with oatmeal on my first case, okay? And you want to know something? I took it, and I won it. And God has been good to me because he's always provided. What you're seeing here, like I said, is something that was written out of pain and suffering of these mothers. You know, when I got a guy from Patterson calling me up, telling me they falsified a judge's signature to come in his house and they found one joint, come on. I mean, I mean, this is insanity. When I, I got a guy now in Brooklyn who just got beaten walking while being black in a Hasidic neighborhood, jumped by 20 Hasidics, caught on film, they, they, he lost vision in his right eye. Do you know that the prosecutor dropped all the charges? This is the kind that. of stuff that I'm fighting now. This is the kind of stuff that we live in and the kind of stuff that Jersey is in. Jersey okay. is just as bad as New York and I'm hoping that we can make a difference. Again, Thank I wanna you. say- Thank, Thank you, you. Mr. Yeah, we have, we, yeah, Hi, we have a couple of questions and we have- a Minutes. We end at seven and we have a couple of questions. A question came in earlier. This may be for, uh, I guess for everyone. We'll start with Brother Pennington. When they ask you to identify yourself when you are not in a car, do you have to state your name? Do you also have to say where you live and do you have to show ID? And that is if you are not in a car. You are required to identify yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I do, do not volunteer any information. If they ask you your name, give them the name. If they want your address, they're not entitled to that bit of information, but they can insist that you show them their, your ID. Um, so I would definitely comply, but I would also let them know my license is in my pocket, I'm gonna go get it. But yes, you do have to identify yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question while I look for that, maybe we can have some closing statements from each of our our guests, uh, Prosecutor uh, McGee, would you like? Sure, I'll be, I'll be very. Um, I think a question came up as to why I switched from uh, defense counsel to prosecutor. I'm a municipal prosecutor, and whether you prosecute or defense, if you're working for the state, you may have immunity as long as you're doing your job and you don't do anything irregular or outside of it. So prosecutors who are uh, charged with complaints and those complaints are found to be valid, the state will not protect you on that. For municipal prosecutors, many of the towns that I serve require a multi-million dollar malpractice insurance policy and it varies from town to town. There is no immunity in that sense. I know I put my hand over my mouth, but actually, um, if you do something outside of the rules and you're found to be doing something unethical or illegal, you will be charged and ultimately um, uh, want to say convicted, but it's, not, it's a civil kind of thing. Uh, the, the other thing is, I'm going to tell you, as a mother, I have grown sons, but when my sons were young, and I'm talking elementary school, I wrote on paper their name, their address, their telephone number, their mother's name, and their father's name, and I laminated it and said, boys, this is your ID, okay? 
if you ever need to show anything, tell people to call your parents, call your parents. And that's what I gave them. So I just thank you all for listening. I thank Linda and her crew. Um, I love this and thank you. Here thank down. you. Down. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, this, this, there's a couple of things that, that I, this is something I'm very passionate about. I, I really love young black men, largely because nobody else loves us. And that's a large part of my clientele. I love these guys. Um, and I am a very staunch advocate for each one of them. Um, so I have gone into court and I have rubbed judges the wrong way. Um, and the judge has said to me, I don't like your attitude, Mr. Pennington. And I've said to him as respectfully as I can, quite frankly, judge, it'd be okay if we got along, but I didn't come here to make friends. So we, we you know, we don't have to get along. That's it. Either way you want to do it is fine with me. Um, Amen. But, but, but the thing that I also want to point out is there's something going on right now that is, that I think is probably the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. There are cops marching with protesters to protest against police brutality. My thing is, Stop brutalizing us and you don't have to march. I, I, you know, it just blows my mind that, that cops are marching against police brutality. So um, Mr. Gomez says that he asked his potential clients, are you guilty? And if, they, he, if he doesn't think they are, he won't represent them. I am the exact opposite. I never ask a client, is he or she guilty? It really doesn't matter. If you're a defendant, I will represent you. If you stand next to me at the table, Dracula can stand next to me. I will represent Dracula. I don't care who you put there. I'm going to represent him. I have never asked a client, is he guilty? It doesn't really matter to me. My job is to make sure that this person is treated fairly and they have followed the Constitution. And as long as that happens, there's not much that I can do. It's when they start cheating is when I get to do my part. And, and, and one thing that... that uh, Mr. McGee will tell you that these, the criminal defense is a very small fraternity. We see each other all the time. Um, and I can go up to, to Connie and she can say, what's going on with this guy? And I can say, truthfully, Connie, he's a knucklehead, but he's a decent guy. What can we do? And she will, okay, he's got a good fit. So we can work something out. Um, I will always tell the truth. I, my reputation is what's vitally important to me. I get along with most prosecutors and I have seen very few who I would say were corrupt. Um, but, but, but most of them, I think are very hardworking, genuine people. Um, and I don't say that about many judges. I, I think the judges are probably more biased than the prosecutors are. Um, Amen. But I, I would certainly think that this is a great opportunity. I enjoy doing this. I will do this every single time. There are things that people have said that I would want to comment on, but we're running out of time. So, um, I can let me do. I can give you my phone number. Anybody can reach out to me at any time. My phone number. This is my cell phone, 609-320-1763. If you have any further questions, please uh, feel free to reach out. My my email is Daryl Pennington at yahoo.com. All one word, Daryl Pennington at yahoo.com. I appreciate you listening to me, and I appreciate the opportunity. And read the book. You have a right to remain innocent. Read the book. Thank you. Again, thank, thank you, you everyone for having us here. Contact information uh, on our Facebook pages. So, uh, Mr. Gomez, uh, some short closing remarks, sure. please. I just want to say thank you everyone for having us. Um, it was great talking with you guys, um, and it was also great, you know, hearing, uh, you know, Mr. Pennington, uh, lawyer Pennington, and Prosecutor uh, Connie as well. Um, I thank you for this opportunity, and I'll do this anytime you guys want. Um, again, I just want to tell everyone, you know, please record. Best thing to do is when you go to court, make sure you record because you don't want to be your word against theirs. Like I say, I win in my cases, always my video against their lie. And in closing, I just want to say one thing. You know, lawyers have to represent if you're guilty or not. Prosecutors, I mean, investigators don't. So when I'm the boss, I decide who I represent, which is innocent people only. And why? Because I'm not going to help anybody get outside to hurt somebody's mother or somebody's sister or daughter, I'm gonna make sure that I only bring out the innocent. On that point, anybody needs me, 347-867-6242. May God bless all of you and may you all stay safe. If you have any me, I'm here. Thank you. Linda, quickly, anything? No, just thank you guys. 
Okay. He did this to his yeah. thunderstorm. Yeah. Thank you thank very much. Yeah. Thank you, criminal defense attorney Daryl Pennington. Thank Bye. you, prosecutor Connie McGee. Thank you, private in guest investigator Manuel Gomez. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Special thanks to my colleague Reggie Blandy and Beth Zach Cohen. Next week, please join us for a discussion about the city of Newark's creation of the Office of Violence Prevention and Senate Bill 2656, which seeks to release disciplinary records of law enforcement officers. Our panelists will be New Jersey Institute of Social Justice fellow Brooke Lewis, Rutgers Law School professor Narinda Hyatt, and attorney, author, and city historian Junius Williams. So thank you for your support of the Newark Public Library. Please wear a mask, be safe, vote. Good night. God bless. Good night. Be safe thank and you. healthy. Thanks. Take care. Okay.